Governor Ron DeSantis has ended his 2024 presidential campaign, endorsing Donald Trump and blasting icky Nikki Haley on the way out. The show starts now. Accordingly, I am today suspending my campaign. I'm proud to have delivered on 100% of my promises, and I will not stop now. It's clear to me that a majority of Republican primary voters want to give Donald Trump another chance. They watch his presidency get stymied by relentless resistance, and they see Democrats using lawfare this day to attack him. Well, I've had disagreements with Donald Trump, such as on the coronavirus pandemic and his elevation of Anthony Fauci, Trump is superior to the current incumbent, Joe Biden. That is clear. I signed a pledge to support the Republican nominee, and I will honor that pledge. He has my endorsement because we can't go back to the old Republican guard of yesteryear, a repackaged form of warmed over corporatism that Nikki Haley represents. I respect Governor Ron DeSantis, and I respect his decision to know when to fold him, because unlike Nikki Haley, who is and always has been in it for herself, Governor Ron DeSantis cares about America, and he cares about the America First movement. Donald Trump is still the standard bearer of this movement today, and we will fight like hell to get him back into office. And when I say we, I hope I can include my fellow DeSantis fans in that category as well. And when 2028 comes around, I hope we will all come together once again and rally around Governor Ron DeSantis because this wasn't his time, but his time is far from over. But with that, there's just one day until New Hampshire's first in the nation primary. And with Trump's margin over Haley widening, the all important question on everyone's mind remains. How long will we have to deal with Nikki Haley? She is not presidential timber. Now, when I say that, that probably means that she's not going to be chosen as a vice president. You You know, you can go. No, you can go, you can go, and you can say certain things, you know, I don't like them, and blah, 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 and this. But when you say certain things, it sort of takes them out of play, right? I can't say, she's not of the timber to be a vice, and then say, ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to announce that I've picked. Do you understand? But that's the way it is, okay? Tell it like it is. Tell it like it is. That was former president and current GOP frontrunner Donald Trump at a rally in Concord, New Hampshire, telling the crowd that Nikki Haley will probably not be his running mate. Running mate, And I don't know about y'all, but probably doesn't give me a whole lot of comfort because I would prefer hell no, no way, when hell freezes over or when pigs fly. But I get it, and I have to respect the strategy. For whatever reason, Nikki Haley is doing well in New Hampshire, far better than she will do in any other state, including her own of South Carolina. So by leaving the door open that Nikki might have a position in the next Trump administration, he's softening himself to the Haley supporters out there who may prefer her for reasons completely unknown known to me, by the way. But joining me now with his reaction uh, to all of that and so much more is host of Mike Crispy Unafraid, Mike Crispy. All right, Mike, I want to start out with Ron DeSantis. Um, I know you've had a lot to say about Ron DeSantis on Twitter over the last uh, several months, but I thought his announcement yesterday and the message that he delivered, I thought that took a lot of class and a lot of grace, and I was supremely proud of the man that I believe to be the best governor in America. Well, I got to tell you, it's about time. Uh, I knew from day one, and so many people did, that Ron DeSantis was walking into a death trap. It was a campaign that started with him. And I think that in the first couple of weeks, we saw Donald Trump only go up in the polls. He never went down one time. So Ron DeSantis got in this race. I'm still not quite sure exactly why, but you know, at the end of the day, did he do the right thing, dropping out, endorsing President Trump? Absolutely. Do I respect him for that? Absolutely. So I think all the voters who are uh, supporting Ron DeSantis, who are now going to support Donald Trump, do I think that's good? Absolutely. It's time that we all come together. Now, there were a lot of people in the DeSantis bandwagon camp that jumped on there and they were doing it for money and they were besmirching President Trump. And that's where I really had an issue was a lot of the Trump hate and people kind of being blinded to the fact that Donald Trump was and will always be in this cycle, as long as he's in politics, the standard bearer. So he did the right thing. We definitely all respect it. We welcome all of the DeSantis voters. Um, and obviously nobody is worse than bird brain Nikki Haley. And she will be out next very soon. 
Yeah. I want to dig into that just a little bit with you because I, I think it's no secret that I obviously am a, a big fan of Governor Ron DeSantis. I do believe him to be the future of the Republican Party. Uh, that was before he announced his candidacy. That was, you know, through the entire cycle. You know, it, it became quite obvious that Donald Trump would be our nominee, obviously, after Iowa. And a lot of us who like Ron DeSantis also, of course, like Donald Trump and have liked Donald Trump and have supported Donald Trump. We also just happen to like Ron DeSantis as well. But my question for you as somebody who has been obviously a Trump supporter through and through on this, never wavered, never even looked over at Ron DeSantis. I have to ask you and, you know, the other kind of hardcore Trump supporters and mega supporters out there, will you now not only welcome DeSantis supporters back into the fold because we're all on the same team after all, but will you also acknowledge that Ron DeSantis is a fantastic governor and probably does have a great future in this party after 2024 and after what we hope to be another Trump presidency? Well, I'll tell you this, do we welcome the supporters? Absolutely. Uh, did Ron DeSantis do very good things in Florida as the governor? Absolutely, those things are undeniable. Now, I'll be very honest with you though, Tommy, I think that Ron DeSantis has hurt his political future. I think there's a large faction of the base that agrees with President Trump saying that loyalty matters. And Donald Trump obviously pointed that out, that Ron DeSantis in running against him uh, was an act of disloyalty. So Donald Trump obviously is the standard bearer saying that, you know, we're going to retire to sanctimonious. We're going to take them in. Uh, we're going to allow the supporters to come in. I think that is a good thing because obviously we need to unite and beat Joe Biden. But I do think that, you know, Ron DeSantis will have problems in the future, because a lot of people are going to be kind of disaffected uh, by some of the ways that he ran the campaign and really not even so much him, but, you know, a lot of the people around him, uh, you know, a lot of the people who were taking these pot shots at President Trump, and they were just kind of being disingenuous, because I think, again, it was long before Iowa, we knew that President Trump had this thing in the bag, and the millions of dollars that was wasted on the experiment of a campaign uh, could have went to helping boost President Trump. Here's the deal, Mike. I want I want to push back on you. Back I want to push yeah. back on you a little bit. I obviously I want Donald Trump to be our next our next president. Uh, I have wanted that. I've worked hard for that in 2016 and 2020, uh, obviously. And I've never took taken issue with Donald Trump being our our president. I also like Ron DeSantis, but I am going to push back on that a little bit because it does still bother me that you know there are Trump supporters that say, oh well, it's an act of disloyalty to even run against Donald Trump. This is America. This is not a, a monarch. You know, you, you can run against whoever you want to run against. And I would also remind folks that back when Donald Trump was running in 2016, some of those folks that ran against him ended up in his administration. So this whole thing about, oh, Ron DeSantis is disloyal. Well, if, if that's the standard, then a lot of the people that Trump brought into the fold during his first administration should have had jobs. Am I right? Well, I mean, that is totally true, but this is what Donald Trump, this is why I think they fear his second term more, because there were a lot of people that were in that administration that obviously were stifling the progress. So I think that this time around, you know, President Trump gets back in the White House. I think there's going to be a lot different standard for the people who are in the cabinet, who are in the administration. And I think that's a good thing. Now, again, I think Ron DeSantis did the right thing. I applaud it. Nobody is worse than Nikki Haley. I think we both agree on that, Tommy. And so welcome the supporters. I think Ron DeSantis uh, you know, could obviously help President Trump, you know, when it comes to getting over the finish line and getting those supporters to support him. But I definitely think that, you know, his future is damaged. However, right now, coming together to beat Joe Biden is the most important thing. And I think it's good that Ron DeSantis goes back to Florida um, and be the governor, because obviously, you know, he's been out campaigning. It'll be great for him to be back uh, as the governor of Florida and a win for Florida, a win for America. I think it's uh, what we needed all along, Tommy. All right. Well, I agree with some of what you said there. I would also remind, you know, Trump supporters and mega supporters and Republicans and conservatives and America first, whatever you want to call all of us that fit into a lot of different buckets under the same umbrella. I would say to me, what's most important looking forward to the next presidential election is not just somebody who is loyal to a man, but somebody who has great policies that are going to advance this country. And if you agree that Ron DeSantis' policies are going to advance this country, then whether you like Donald Trump now, you should probably look at Ron DeSantis in 2028 if he continues to govern Florida the way he has and he continues with the policies that he's put forward, probably stick with that rather than who Donald Trump likes. So that would be my only thing. I do want to move on now, though, to, uh, to Nikki. Haley and what's going to happen tomorrow in New Hampshire. I think she's probably going to do well. I think we're all, you know, quite aware of that. I think that New Hampshire is going to be an anomaly where she does well. I don't think she's going to do well anywhere else. But what is, you know, in, in your vision, what does the, the mega movement, the Trump movement, 
What do they do to push Nikki Haley out sooner rather than later? Beyond just winning in New Hampshire, it's going to probably take more than that to get her to butt out. Well, I think, again, the, the greatest brander in politics, you know, branding people is President Trump. And I think that he now, now that it's a mano a mano race, I think he has an opportunity to go after her and expose just how terrible her record is. She wants to raise the retirement age while simultaneously exporting billions of your tax dollars to other countries. She's a sympathizer of BLM. She bought into the Bubba Wallace hoax. She plays the race card like she's Hillary Clinton. She has an illegal immigration policy like she's Hillary Clinton. I mean, nobody is more insufferable than Nikki Haley. So I think President Trump now being able to focus on it, talk about it, all the spotlight turned against her, really the spotlight that was kind of like with DeSantis before, I think she'll welt under that. I think that, you know, no matter what she does in New Hampshire uh, tomorrow, I think that she's going to have a really hard time in South Carolina. You obviously saw Governor McMaster on the stage with President Trump uh, the other night, and you see the whole entire South Carolina delegation up and down supporting him. So I think once President Trump has a re uh, resounding finish, in Nikki Haley's home state, I don't think there's any way she stays in the race after that. I think this is like a pipe dream of the neocons and the uniparty trying to put all of their chips in in the 11th hour for Nikki Haley. It's just not going to work. You know, you just can't stop President Trump's momentum. Right. Well, even just beyond that, you know, even if it wasn't against Donald Trump, I just wouldn't like Nikki Haley in general. I thought she was also the wrong pick to be UN ambassador. I, I've never liked Nikki Haley. I've always seen through Nikki Haley. I think most of us have been following politics, have seen through Nikki Haley, those that were familiar with just the way that she governed and also familiar with just her overall ideology, uh, you know, as you mentioned, being a neocon and also being, you know, very Democrat light. Uh, if not full Democrat in many instances. But, you know, I wonder there as well when it comes to the running mate situation. I played that clip. Nikki Haley, probably not the running mate. You've been very vocal on Twitter about who you think will and will not have it. You said Tim Scott, you know, he took too long to endorse President Trump. You don't see that being a possibility. You know, who do you see as a possibility for Trump's running mate? Well, it's a great question. Uh, people who are saying Ron DeSantis, I don't think it's going to be Ron DeSantis. I never thought that. But it really uh, can't with the, be with the logistically. The yeah. So logistically, yeah. I don't think it, yeah, it could exactly. be. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. So it's not going to be DeSantis. I mean, people are starting to say that again. I don't see that. Um, I see names that are being floated out there. I almost think that people are, you know, putting themselves in through the media. Like I think Elise Stefaniak, I personally don't think she's being up for consideration, but I see her name starting to creep out there. Is she positioning herself for that? I think Tim Scott, he was on the stump the other night. He's positioning himself for that. I think a lot of people are doing like this jockeying right now. You heard Vivek talking about it. I think they're doing this jockeying to try to get President Trump's attention to say, hey, I could be the guy or I could be the woman. And I think that's all well and good, but I don't think any of those people are, are in contention. I think that the pick is going to be somebody who uh, has been loyal through and through. I see names that are being considered right now. You hear names like uh, Dr. Ben Carson. You hear people like Christy Nome. Then you hear like, you know, wild cards. People talk about Tucker Carlson. So, I mean, there's, there's picks out there that I think uh, aren't really getting all the media attention because those people aren't putting their name in for media, well, to be, you know, speculation to, be to fair, drive the storyline up. To be fair, Christy Nome has been trying to put her name in that bin for quite a while now. In fact, I mean, she's almost like auditioning to be the real housewife of the White House. Unfortunately, as somebody who's a, you know, South Dakotan, um, who worked for Christy Nome when I was 18 years old, uh, I can tell you that Christy Nome definitely wants to be considered, and she is doing the most, to, in my opinion, to float her name out there. She would be the absolute wrong choice, by the way. And if I ever get the opportunity to tell the Trump team that, I will voice it loudly, because those of us who are born and raised in South Dakota are very familiar with Christy Nome, and we're not fans. Uh, I will just say that. But I do think that there are uh, other yeah. other people. I think Sarah Sanders might be a good uh, choice. I talked to Sean Spicer last week. He floated Senator Marsha Blackburn out there, which would make me very happy because I'm in Tennessee. Um, do you think it's going to be a woman? Well, you know, I, I think that the woman thing, I've read reports that the woman thing was originally, it was in the cards, but I think right now they're just looking at the best pick. I actually think, again, I, I think you pick, it's a meritocracy, right? You pick the best 
individual over whether they're a man or whether they're a woman. I actually think a dark horse that people aren't talking about, somebody who I really like, if you said who could be vice president of anybody, I would say Dr. Rand Paul. I mean, think about it, rolling back the administrative state, uh, personal liberties, going after Dr. Fauci was a great ally to the president during his first term uh, for helping his agenda through in the Senate. So how about Dr. Rand Paul? I mean, he's got the never Nikki thing he's leading the way on. So nobody's talking about that name, but I think you know, you have the right individual over a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. And I think you do that. I think that is how you get over the finish line because independents aren't going to go, oh, well, it's a woman. So I'm going to vote, you know, for President Trump. I think they're going to make their determination on many more factors than just that. I think it's going to be sensible policy to independents, particularly independents in suburbs and near major cities um, who have been really uh, jostled, if you will, with the illegal immigration stuff. So I think you just need the right person who can articulate to independence. I don't think that that necessarily, Tommy, has to be a woman. Uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah. You know, I would, Rand Paul, I think would be an excellent choice, but I think that he might have more power and influence in his current position. That would be my only thing. I think we need him there. Um, so that would be my only thing. But you know, obviously a great warrior and somebody who would be excellent in the role and in any role, in, in my opinion. Also, by the way, ran against uh, Donald Trump in 2016. So your whole loyalty thing little interesting, Mike, a little interesting. Um, well, maybe that only applies to Ron DeSantis. <laughs> but Well, I, I mean, Ron, Donald Trump made Ron DeSantis' career. Rand Paul was an established senator at the time. So respect, respectfully, I think there's a difference. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Uh, to be fair, Governor Ron DeSantis did hold other positions. He didn't come from the Burger King um, to the governor of Florida, but I, I respect it. I, I know that the, the mega lenses are on thick and, and that's okay. And I, I, um, I'm all for it. So that's all right. Uh, I want to talk about something else in the, in the realm of mega. All right. So we keep seeing these protests that are supposed to be pro pro Trump protests. And obviously a lot of people on social media are calling them out saying this is quite obviously a, a fed job. Um, we see the, you know, the images with the masks and the face masks and all that. And we have some of those images as well. And I know that you were tweeting about it uh, as well. Do you think that this is pretty obvious at this point that these people that are marching under the guise of being mega or pro Trump are, are obviously not that? Well, I'll tell you this. I mean, it just makes sense, doesn't it? You know, major city, New York. I live in the state of New Jersey. Matter of fact, President Trump is in position to win New Jersey. Shout out to Congressman Jeff Andrew leading the charge. And then in New York, President Trump says he can make a play there as well. And I'm in New York all the time. And independents and people you would never think would say, hey, I could see myself voting for President Trump. They're saying that now, Tommy. So what better ploy for the Democrats and the left wing to do than to just continue doing what they've done the whole time. Scare tactics, intimidation, fear, not new ideas, not cleaning up the city, not making people feel good. Let's scare them. Let's say, look, these big, bad insurrectionists, they're marching. This is in the financial district in lower Manhattan. They're marching in this in this uh, quiet New York City neighborhood because they're trying to intimidate people. It's just ridiculous. So, you know, I definitely think that a lot of this trickery, if you will, uh, will unfold again and again. We know now what we know about January 6th and a lot of the improprieties and federal involvement, just things that keep being outed that just doesn't make sense, the new pipe bomb revelations. So I think we're going to see more of the same, not Democrats trying to win on issues and exchange of ideas, but win on dirty tricks and win with intimidation tactics like this. New York City is a hellhole right now. I walk in it every day. Migrants are lying down the streets at the administration buildings to get blankets and food and papers to file lawsuits. And the American people are saying, just clean up New York City. Democrats go, no, no, we can't do that because we need these people to become future voters. So let's just scare them and say that, well, well MAGA will be worse. Look, they're marching on New York City. They're coming for you next. So what a typical tactic. These people are so unintelligent. They don't have original ideas. More of this stuff and uh, clearly, you know, a lot of America First Patriots don't feel the need to march in New York City. I think voters know what needs to be done there. We are working in our communities to win local elections rather yeah. than stuff like that. Well, and also it just um, the coordination with the, the khaki pants and the, you know, the blue jackets and, you know, all color coordinated. Uh, I've, I've been to a lot of Trump events. I have never seen that kind of coordination with everybody dressing that way. Like, you know, they just got off of a, a yacht in Nantucket. That's really not the vibe that I get uh, from a lot of Trump supporters. So it's interesting, though. And I think it's also a quieting technique. I think the left 
wants those of us that are Trump supporters, those of us that are mega and, and all this, uh, they want us to shut up and be quiet because they don't want us, uh, they want us to feel as though we should be ashamed of being Trump supporters because if we are Trump supporters, then we must be insurrectionists, we must be racist, we must be all these things that they've characterized. So I see that. Uh, I want to ask you too, though, about something I am a little concerned about and I can't quite figure out, and that's Biden fundraising. So the, the Biden team and their affiliated PACs and the DNC, they They've raised a lot of money. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars, and it's dwarfing the effort of Trump and Republicans. And we all know that Biden is very unpopular. So what do you attribute that to, these huge fundraising totals that Biden's been able to amass, especially in the last part of 2023, raking in millions and millions of dollars? Well, this is the MO of the Democrat Party, right? They get a lot of money from a few amount of people. And the Republicans, we have a small donations in massive numbers. It's amazing how that has become the trend. So with Joe Biden having all this money, it was the same story with Hillary Clinton back in 2016. She had a massive fundraising advantage over President Trump. But they always say this, candidates who are getting money from either self-funding or from a few big donors, they almost always lose comparatively to candidates who have a little bit of less money but are getting donations from a lot of people in a smaller amount because people feel bought into the campaign. People feel like they're a part of it. They're getting into the community. Also, you know, when it comes to earned media and stuff like that, we saw just how important that was in the year 2016. And we see, again, Donald Trump dominating earned media, so much so that MSNBC knows it. And now Rachel Maddow is coming out straight up saying, we can't even show President Trump's speeches anymore. We're not even going to put them on because they're lies and we can't show them. No, they just don't want to give him the platform for people to see his ideas because they might say, wow, this kind of makes sense. Yeah, maybe we shouldn't have illegal immigrants flooding the country and relocated in five-star hotels in New York. Maybe that's not good. So I do think that the fundraising has always been like that. It is wild to think, Tommy, that people give this kind of money, but it goes to show you who the Biden regime is interested in serving. They're not interested in serving the rank and file people, just like Nikki Haley is in. They want you to be a working class slave and they serve these corporatists at the top that are bankrolling these campaigns. So Donald Trump and the Republicans are funded by grassroots. It's less money, but there's more enthusiasm. There's more earned media. There's more social media attention, really. And I'm not too worried about that because that's, I feel like, how it's always been yeah. in the last decade, if you will, with these Democrat candidates. It's just surprising to me, given that Biden is so unpopular, even within the Democrat Party, and they don't want him to run, but there's still all this money coming in. You'd think that there would be donors who might be a little disillusioned with that. They wouldn't want to give their money to someone like Joe Biden because they see him as a failure. But again, I've always held that come convention time, we're going to see a new candidate anyway. So... You never know. Uh, last thing I do want to ask you about, though, is whether it's Joe or whoever, uh, you know, any Democrat in office is going to make these big promises to get young people. And now we've got the student loan forgiveness, nearly five billion in student loan debt, you know, obviously wants to do more. And although I feel like this is not only wrong and ridiculous and is going to upset a lot of people, we have to be honest, Mike, there are a lot of young people out there that see this and they see free money and they think that Papa Joe gave it to them and they are going to be uh, you know, a formidable voting block, the Gen Zs and the millennials. So how do you think that Donald Trump and the Republicans combat that, combat free money? It's not the easiest thing to fight against, especially with young people. No, it's, it's not the easiest thing to fight against. You're absolutely right. I saw a Gallup poll out that when it comes to young men, actually the support for Republicans has gone up. It was like 28% like in 2013, and now it's almost like 50% of young men. So that's a good trend that young men are seeing what President Trump does, uh, and they're starting to gravitate towards that. So that's a good sign. And I do not think it's going to be Joe Biden. I have long maintained that they will replace him in the 11th hour with Michelle Obama to specifically do just that. Make a play to young people, make a play to the urban areas, which are up in arms right now about the Ill illegal immigration stuff. So I don't think this race is going to be anything like what's being advertised right now, because I think they just can't go along with what I call the vegetable in chief, Joe Biden, there slurring his words, you know, not talking to the inner cities and kind of bypassing just how chaotic it is there. So I think they're going to do something crazy because they're going to need that urban young vote in order to even have 
have a shot if the Republicans and President Trump peels off 10, 15 percent. He wins in a landslide in all these swing states and he wins blue states like New Jersey and New York. So I think you're totally right. I think they see that, you know, Democrats, they're sinister. They're not stupid. They're sinister. So I think they'll be replacing Joe Biden. My pick is Michelle Obama. Watch that happen. They need that young vote. Uh, that's a that's a pretty bold statement that Trump could win uh, New York and New Jersey. Uh, I'm not sure that that's going to happen. But, uh, you know, I appreciate the, the confidence and the optimism on that and maybe California, who knows. But I think we should maybe just focus on the swing states that are winnable at this point. But, Mike, you know, I appreciate you. And again, I'm going to hold you to that 2028. Ron DeSantis, he still has the career that he has and he's still, you know, kicking ass in Florida and killing woke wherever it lives. I'm hoping that we're going to have your support because, you know, I think a lot of us DeSantis folks that are Trump folks eh, through and through as well, I think we're all going to unify together in 2024 and we just hope to see the same thing from you guys come 2028 and I'm going to hold you to it. We'll have the greatest four years of our life in the next Trump administration. It'll be teed up on a silver platter, and we'll come back on and talk about it then, Tommy. But we'll have a lot of winning from now until then, a lot of success, and the country will be back in great shape. So we'll talk more about it, but it was, right. it was great talking to you, and thank you so much for having me on. All right. I hope you're right, and I will talk to you soon. God bless. All right, folks. A failed male golfer has rejuvenated his career by, you guessed it, competing against women and beating them. And yeah, I have some final thoughts. Folks, meet Haley Davidson. That delicate little flower is the transgender golfer, you're shocked, I know, who just won the next women's classic in Florida, beating out female golfers and propelling Davidson to the top of the tour's leaderboard. Davidson's score sits at 1320, and that's 150 points ahead of the second place challenger, a woman. And if simply beating the women competing in the women's golf classic wasn't enough, Davidson also got paid nearly 1600 bucks. This season, Davidson has made a little over four grand with eight more events left to go before the next tour championship at the end of March. It's important to note that the next golf organization, by its own description, is designed to, quote, elevate women's golf and prepare the world's best young women professional golfers for a successful career on the LPGA Tour. Long live the patriarchy, I suppose. Y'all, this is not going to end. A couple of years ago, it was pretty much just Leah Thomas pulling this crap, but now the deck is stacked with men competing against and masquerading as women. And why? Because society failed the social experiment. We bought into it. We stepped back and allowed it. Even those of us who have always found it wrong, we still sat back and let it commence with the pie in the sky hope that Leah Thomas would be an outlier or an anomaly. I think we were naively hopeful that Thomas would be a one-off and that the clear and present level of unfairness and lunacy would put an end to it. That this social experiment would run its course. Well, we were wrong because now incidents of this keep happening and more frequently. And now we're behind the eight ball fighting to get out of the quicksand. Now, don't get me wrong, it's still worth the fight, and we can win the war on this, but it's going to take a hell of a lot more work now. So let this be a lesson the next time some ludicrous social experiment comes around. In fact, come to think of it, we are there right now with the puberty blockers and the bodily mutilation of minors. And if we don't fight back and reverse all of this, we're going to be sitting here five to ten years from now grappling with not only the extinction of women's sports, but the irreversible mutilation of this generation. Now is no time to be politically correct or patient. And I'd also like to point out that seven years ago, almost to this very day, more than a million people took to the streets of D.C. and cities around the globe for the Women's March. And today, half of those people probably couldn't tell you what a woman is. But those are my final thoughts from Nashville. God bless and take care.